Right, welcome back. Welcome back from lunch, everyone. Um, welcome back to one of those in my last session. I'm talking about something completely different now. Um, that last session was filling a last minute cancellation. So, uh, what I want to talk to you today uh, about is, is some, some performance tweaks and tips that we've, uh, that we've picked up along the way. Um, ICOS do, basically, we only do Drupal Commerce builds. We are a Drupal specialist agency and we deal with quite a lot of high traffic stuff. Um, some of what you'll find in this session I think will be maybe obvious. Uh, my aim is that you come away with one little trick that you might not have heard of before. Maybe you'll have heard of them all, but um, some of them are Drupal specific, some of them are Drupal commerce specific, and some of them are just generally Drupal. So what this session really is based on, um, if you were at my last session, you'll know that we've been working with Lush, the cosmetics company, for the last uh, year and a bit on um, building out their Drupal Commerce site. Um, so a lot of what we're talking about today is stuff that we've learned from that project. It's nice to people coming in, but it's fine, we'll, we'll recap. Um, so Lush.co.uk was, was relaunched in Drupal, Drupal Commerce, uh, in April, well, March 31st this last year, uh, 2014. Uh, it gets about one and a half million visitors per month in the UK, and it was a pretty heavyweight design in terms of <coughs> media rich, lots of video, lots of content. It's a content driven commerce site, um, inline videos on almost every product. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, this sort of traffic, it has profiles of traffic that go up and down seasonally, uh, Mother's Day, Christmas, Valentine's Day, those sorts of events that we have to be, have to be ready for. Um, so uh, basically what I want to talk to you about today is some of the stuff that we've learned on this site. You can apply pretty much anywhere. Some of the stuff that was just, that might have led us down a blind alley and some of the stuff that was just really obvious checklist things. So first of all, why, why is performance important? Just to set the context here. When you're dealing with e-commerce, it's actually incredibly important to get your performance right. So these stats I've pulled off of uh, Kissmetrics. I don't know where they're sourced from, honestly, but we all know that there is a pattern of if you know, customers expect a site to load in a certain period of time, and if they don't, they wander off. Now, if you're in a very competitive market, commodity market, then this is a big problem. For someone like Lush, of course, they are in a nice position where people are coming there because they want that product and no one else can sell it. So for them, not so bad, but they still want to be able to deliver pages snappily, give a really good customer experience. What we're trying to avoid is customer site uh, basket abandonment. And another set here, um, a one second delay decreases customer satisfaction by 16%. Now, although Lush are in a lovely position of uh, you know, people coming there and knowing what product they, they want, they are absolutely obsessive with customer satisfaction. And their, their number one aim in, in business is make, making sure customers are, are delighted. So a slow performing website is not really on the cards for them. And we've also got the social aspect. 44% of online shoppers will tell their friends about a bad experience online. And that's certainly the case with, with any, any company. Lush, Lush is no exception. Lush actually has their own little fan base of they call Lushies, who are very vocal, and anything, anything that goes wrong, they are going to be there telling everyone. So we need to make sure that, that this site performs particularly well. Before we can make any decisions about whether things are performing well or not, what we need is a really good set of tools to, to measure performance. What we use, uh, not just here but everywhere, uh, we use a tool called New Relic. As Anyone come across this before? A few people? Okay. Um, if I've got some time at the end, I'll take you into the depths of New Relic. But on the surface, what it is, it's a, it's a tool that plugs into your servers and, and records everything that's going on. So from New Relic, you can tell exactly uh, how quickly pages are responding. But more importantly than that, you can dig right into the depths of every transaction that happens in PHP and figure out exactly what's making it slower than you want it to be. So this random snapshot shows that we are delivering pages in about 600 milliseconds, which is exactly where we want to be. Um, and the different colors there represent the different 
parts of the system. So the light blue at the bottom represents how long PHP is doing its thing. The uh, yellow is representing database time. The blue is representing memcache, which we'll come on to in a minute. And the green represents stuff external, like web service calls and that sort of thing, things that you might not be able to control so well. So we can see here that um, you know, the, the light blue at the bottom is, is the stuff that, if we code badly, that's going to go up. The, the database stuff, if we don't optimize our queries properly, that's what's going to go up. And, and what we're looking for is the, the memcache layer, which is where it's pulling stuff directly from memory to take up the majority, hopefully. So we were able to, you know, when we, when we initially built the site, we were looking at eight second page loads because the site was so complicated. And uh, there's a few people in my particular in the room that were working on this at the time, knows what a disaster that felt like at the time. Obviously that was pre-launch uh, and we were able to optimize it right down to where it is now. I just brought, could have brought that up here, there you go. <laughs> so yeah, that's just showing you. Uh, so what it, what it allows you to do here is dig into the depths of those. You can actually drill through to transactions. You can get it all the way down to specific database calls and find out where your problems, where your bottlenecks are. And it might not always be where you think it is. For example, when we, uh, when we were originally developing this, we were, we were using PHP 5.4. Um, and actually, I went to a session at Drupal Camp Scotland uh, by Lorna Jane. And she was like, everyone's got to upgrade to PHP 5.5. And I thought, okay, we probably should do that, because to me, I live in this Drupal world, and I don't really care much about the version of PHP I'm using. Um, we switched to PHP 5.5 and knocked that blue, half, that blue section was cut in half immediately. So the performance of PHP 5.5, not to be underestimated. So uh, our setup here is an Acquia-based setup. It's, we use Acquia Cloud Enterprise, as you can imagine, this is a, obviously a high street retailer, so there's a lot of traffic. Um, we use Acquia because it's a platform as a service, so ICOS doesn't have to, or Lush in particular, don't have to deal with the infrastructure <coughs> services. Um, in particular, we've got a, a load balancing on Varnish, which is, in Acquia's case, is an Nginx. So Varnish, if, if you want to just stick your hand up, if, if any of these things are unfamiliar, sometimes People know what these stuff things are, but Varnish is basically a reverse proxy cache. And the idea of Varnish is that we want to deliver as much content from there as possible because it's caching the entire page. If you're delivering something from Varnish, Drupal doesn't even bootstrap. You know, so the thing we're trying to achieve is avoiding, not only making Drupal faster, but avoiding hitting Drupal at all if we can, because there are much faster ways to deliver those pages. So we've got... Um, dedicated memcache service, which I'll come to. We've got dedicated search service, dedicated database service. So there's a big cluster of stuff. And in particular, you know, making all those things work together is why we use the Acquia platform, because I wouldn't want to try and figure out how to join all that lot together. And it's certainly a specialist job, and I prefer to, uh, to work on the platform as a service. I can just phone up and say, okay, we need a better database server now, and we get one. So of course these things cost. But, you know, this is the principle of what we're working on here. So before we can uh, start working on our, our design, or our design of application, we have to think about what we're looking at here. What we find is that you can't just design to get this one page working. When, you're start, when you start to scale uh, Drupal at any, any degree, you need to think about how many, how many requests you're going to get and what those requests are going to look like and can that architecture scale? So for example, for us, you know, when, we're, when we're thinking about Christmas, we, we know that Christmas is gonna be uh, 10 times, 20 times busier than the whole rest of the year. So we've gotta be able to, we don't need that level of architecture for the rest of the year. So we need to know that we can expand and contract our, our architecture as we go. And we need to know how many concurrent users we've got. Uh, and we can look at the, the history through Google Analytics and we can start figuring some of this stuff out. Um, but what we don't know is if we're successful and we, we do a lovely relaunch of a site that makes it much more popular, then of course those figures are not high enough. Um, so we're looking at what's the profile of the traffic, um, what time period, and at what point uh, do we lose the ability to cache that traffic? Because in the, in the case of a commerce site, 
if the user's logged in, okay, we all understand that once you're logged in, you can't deliver cache content. But actually, when someone's put something in their basket, the way that Drupal Commerce works is that immediately that's going to invalidate the cache. And that makes sense because you don't want to see someone else's basket. Um, but actually, a lot of people, yeah, we need to know how many people are, are going to be active on the site rather than just looking around before they put stuff in their basket. And then we are looking at single page performance because how quickly can we get that page to the user? And then more importantly than that, how, can, how quickly can the user start engaging with that page? So I haven't shown you much of the site itself, but if you have a look, the, the pages are really long. It's a very content rich site. And what we want to be able to do is make sure that you know, it's going to take the customer five, ten minutes to probably, I don't know, read everything on that page. But we want to make sure they can start engaging with the page really, really quickly. So we have to be, be aware of that. So that's sort of the background of what we're trying to achieve. And then what I'm going to go on to do now is talk about some of the different techniques um, that we've used. And they're not all related. They're some of them, it's literally just little tips and tricks and recipes. But the obvious stuff uh, is starting inside Drupal, Drupal caching. So Drupal has a number of inbuilt uh, think functions that work for caching. You can cache blocks, you can cache pages, you can aggregate CSS, you can aggregate JavaScript. I'm going to assume that you know all those things. So if you don't, if, don't worry, you can just stick your hand up and throw me over something that I'm saying is obvious and it isn't. Um, because I've, got, I've just got so much other bits and pieces I want to go through. So we've got internal Drupal caching, we have to make sure that's working fundamentally. We then we've, we've got the varnish stuff, which is what I, I talked about just now. So what we're doing there is we're having a, a completely independent server in front of Drupal, which the first time someone requests a page, it captures that entire page, and the next time someone in the same circumstances, whether it be anonymous, comes along, then they receive the same page. And when we do that, we means we've not gone to Drupal, therefore we can deliver that page in, I don't know, hundreds of a second rather than you know, half a second. So we're immediately, we're taking the load away from Drupal and we're reserving the Drupal stack to be doing the stuff that can't be cached, like processing orders and, and logged in activity and stuff like that. And next thing we have is, uh, is a memcached service. Now what these are, Drupal has loads of, if you look inside the database uh, of Drupal, it has loads of cache tables that are created. And what memcache does is takes some of those tables and puts them into active memory. Um, so obviously you can imagine that getting data out of memory is much, much quicker than getting it from a database. So using memcache means that the stuff that you need quite often, the heavily cached stuff, um, is pulled directly from memory significantly faster than it would be, would be normally. And then the last one I've got here is the, is the CDN. So a CDN is a content delivery network. And what we use these for is to, to separate some of the delivery of content away from, away from Drupal again, things like images, maybe JavaScript files, putting those elsewhere. Uh, and we'll cover a little bit more about that in a minute as well. So what I'm gonna do is tell you very specifically about the things that we used in this case. Um, we used Cloudflare as a product out there. Um, it has a couple of features that, that we really liked. Um, the idea of Cloudflare, it's a, it's a CDN at its base, and, and the whole point of a CDN is that it puts the content nearer to the point of, nearer to the origin point of the user. So if you host your site in Ireland and you've got a customer in Australia, obviously the content has got to get across the world, the world to get there. So what a CDN is able to do is it caches that content in a local server in Asia Pacific somewhere um, so that the, the transition time is much shorter. These are all, we're talking about you know, hundreds of milliseconds, but all these things add together to, to make fast performance. Um, the, this particular product also does things like smart caching. So if it knows that the origin point of the user is 3G, um, it will send a, a low res version of that image across. And we don't have to think about that logic on our ends. It's just one of those things that the product does. And then when the customer sees the image, they can click it to make the high res one load. So again, that means we're, we're getting much faster delivery to mobile devices. 
And the other feature that they uh, they promote quite heavily, but sounds good, but I'm not quite sure in Drupal practice whether it's brilliant. They they compare their version to the version on Drupal, and only send the ones in North that are different. Basically, send a diff between the two. Theoretically, meaning you're sending a lot less data across the network. Um, from my perspective, our aim was to reduce the load on Drupal. Doing a diff didn't reduce the load on Drupal at all, because we've still got to generate the page even though we're not sending it all. So, oh, Slightly related question to that. Is it easy to make an editing environment where you give them a nice, simple making a product, but the files get put into a CDN? Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether it's on a later slide, but we use um, Cloudinary, which is a product. It, it, when you look at its feature set, do you know remember the, the image cache module, uh, which is now core in Drupal 7, um, when you send a specific URL, it generates an image of the right dimensions. Um, Cloudinary is a service that does that. Um, and when it came out, everyone was like, ah, Drupal does this anyway. But it actually does that, and it's a CDN. So, and it has some other cool things, like you can say, um, center the image on the face, for example, which Drupal can't do. Um, so yeah, that, and what we've done with that is integrated it with the media module, so that it will, um, when you browse an image and upload one, it will send it straight to Cloudinary. Craig Moore isn't in here, but he did all the work, and he's around, if you, if you spot this guy. Um, he might be presenting on something else, but he did a lot of work on that, if you want to find out more about that. So that's Cloudflare. Memcached, uh, well, I sort of talked about that basically, but it takes, that's their definition, uh, in memory key value store for small chunks of arbitrary data. Uh, in Drupal terms, that means taking pieces of cache data, storing them in memory, delivering them really, really fast. And that alone, giving that enough capacity in memory, just you know, makes your performance 80% faster or something ridiculous. It's just crazy. Okay, so now I'm going to get into some sort of nitty gritty, shall we say, um, and come up with some of the very specific things that we found on, on this site. The semaphore table in Drupal um, is, is the thing that records transaction locking. So if, you've, if you're locking a record, you know, basically you don't want two people editing the same thing at the same time. So there's a, a concept called the semaphore table in Drupal core. Um, what we found though is when you throw enough users at it, it can't process quick enough, and you start to get slow loading tables, you start to get transaction deadlocking. Um, what we discovered uh, was that there is a way out there to transfer that to memcache, which means it's handling that faster and you're not seeing the contention locking. And ju just that one, literally one line of change, that, those, the top three lines are integrating memcache at all, and the bottom one is changing the lock files to use memcache. And just doing that, uh, in a particularly busy period, we were getting lots of database errors and yeah, contention errors and stuff like that. Putting that in, magic, all gone. So, it, the, my principle on, on performance, especially on, on these big sites, is that every little thing, it's like doing like Formula One or something, you, you're not going to make a one second per lap difference, but you are going to add together one tenth here, a hundredth of a second here, and, and get that performance. The next thing, oh, this is terrible. It's too bright in here, isn't it? Um, okay, is it just the sun? And um, lazy loading, we found, you know, we've got these high design pages here, and there are some elements of it where uh, what you can't quite see here is a little speech bubble here. If you look on the Lush site, there's this little speech bubble in the corner. It's a design element, and what it does, when you, open, when you click it, it pops out this sidebar with all the social media chatter. And I don't know how many people really use it, um, maybe lots. But the point is, if you're shopping, it's not your primary function on the site. So there's no point loading all that content until you really need it. So we adapted that to, be, um, to use lazy loading. So we're looking at all the elements on the page and thinking about, does the user really need this right now, or do they only need it when they ask for it? So what we're able to do then is take certain elements of the page 
like this one, so it only loads that social content. Now, of course, the trade-off is that there's a slight delay when you do that, um, but the main thing is that we're delivering the, the main content of the page as quickly as we possibly can. The other aspect of this one is it's the same on the other side of the design, where you have the basket. So, the only you know, when you add something to your to your basket, you've got notification. This particular design has a slide out basket on the right hand side, which then shows your recommendations and so on. Again, if I'm browsing around the site, I don't necessarily need that content. I don't need and loading that content is quite expensive because it's got to come out of the commerce order table, which might have a million orders in it or something. Um, so what we've done there again is using the lazy loading, actually just simple um, JavaScript, Ajax kind of lazy loading. When you expand the window, it loads your basket in subsequent to that. So it's about protecting, you know, delivering as little as we, as we can get away with and, able, and then sort of fulfilling out the page later on. Richard, can I ask which JS library you use? Oh no, sorry, I just didn't hear who was talking to <laughs> Can I ask what JavaScript library you use? The, this is all using just the core Drupal 8 Ajax stuff. So that's all it is. It's using, doing, doing Ajax in Drupal 7 properly, using the, the built-in stuff, um, uh, using callbacks within Drupal custom modules, basically. So that was that one. The next thing we, uh, we discovered was, was AuthCache. Um, Again, our fundamental aim, so the best way we can increase performance is to make sure that Varnish is delivering almost all the pages. And in order to do that, we need to make sure that Varnish knows it's allowed to deliver those pages and they're not invalidated in the cache. So what we're able to do here, um, the moment someone's logged in, then Drupal will always say invalid. No, don't cache this. This is a logged in user's content now. Don't cache this under any circumstances. It'll also do that um, when, uh, when there's something in the basket, for obvious reasons. But, when you look at your design... Sorry, oh, it, did you just say that it will stop caching because there's something in the basket? Yeah. That's what I've seen, yes. Oh my god. Which is really right. annoying. That and you can understand... The question. I couldn't work out. Yeah, right. Yeah. You can understand why it would, because obviously yeah. if, if you've done your basket as a block, so even if you've got just the link to the basket with the basket and... As soon as something's in the basket, as soon as that user has committed something, done an add to basket action, <coughs> then your varnish won't work. Because Rawls is already running and it's doing a print calculation of prices within the basket. Yep. Even if you've got no products up on screen. Yep. So really annoying, but it is... <laughs> this is what I was hoping. You can take one thing away and it will be somewhere, an avenue to investigate. Auth cache. Um, what we were looking at here is, okay, look, this design, when I'm logged in, the only thing that's different is that little picture and my name. The rest of, you know, 200, 300k delivery is exactly the same. So it's really frustrating that I can't cache that anymore. Now, AuthCache uh, gives us a, a way to get around that. It's actually got some sub-modules within it that specifically do things like load the image profile, the profile image for the user and load the username. Um, so there's a couple of ways to do it. Edge side includes is something you might hear talked about. I've not gone into that today because I didn't use that technique. But an edge side include is when you do two calls to the server, one to get the picture and the name and one to get the rest of the page. Um, you have to fiddle with your varnish configuration to make that stuff work. And because we're using Acquia, their, their platform is standard. It's like a reference platform. You don't really fiddle with it. Um, so we can go down that route. But AuthCache um, actually does, in a, a Drupal level, allow you to cache things which you wouldn't normally cache. Pretty dangerous. You have to know what you're doing and, and understand what it's doing. Um, but it does allow you to then deliver that entire page and then insert that face and name later on. So it has got you know, sub-modules in there that, build, that are really designed. In fact, it's even got a mode designed to handle that shopping cart situation, which is how I found it in the first place. I think um, Pedro uh, Canberra, who, who came up with that uh, originally, I think, or Hanani, I can't remember, sorry. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, preventing cash bypass. So that's again one of the one of the big things we're looking for. I think I've duplicated that slide by mistake. Okay, next thing. This one, this one really tripped me up. Um, Drupal Commerce will lock an order <coughs> when it's loaded. So if you do a in a custom module or whatever, you do an order load, that order is then locked for the duration of the transaction, which makes sense because you don't want two people modifying an order. So orders are by definition transactional. <coughs> Again, in a high, high volume system, you might be doing other stuff with those orders and those might include a customer service team searching for an order, doing edits for a customer. But more commonly in our case, it was things like batch scripts, picking up orders and moving them to the next system in the chain for dispatch. Um, and what we found was we thought we had a big performance problem, but the reality in the end was that we, we had a batch script that picked up 50 orders at a time and moved them to another system. And if, if the order you were trying to load was in those 50, because it didn't release them until the end of the script. So because of that, I've got customer care team we're trying to load an order and it's timing out. It's waiting 30 seconds to get that order released and then it, it doesn't release in time. So the report to me is, oh, we've got a big performance problem, or we've got an error. But the, eventually, we figured out that it was that. So a note is, be careful when running searches or batch scripts or anything like that, because what you can end up with is something that feels like a performance issue, which really isn't. It's actually a contention issue. Um, so that was just a little tip that might save you a, a week, <laughs> if, if you ever come across it. <laughs> And our, our, our way around this stuff is to use things like QAPI. QAPI is in core. Um, and what it allows you to do is to define an arbitrary queue um, and then send content to it. So what we can do, if we need to send 100 orders to another system, what we now do is send 100 orders to the queue and then process the queue one item at a time. And therefore, we're only ever locking that one order for the you know, half a second or a second that it needs to transfer and then releasing it again. Whereas before, if we were sending 100, you know, it could take 200 seconds to release that lock by the time it finished everything. Right, so this is all very random now. It's all random little bits of information that aren't necessarily related to each other. Fast 404 is our next one. Um, you get, you know, a 404 page uh, traditionally will bootstrap Drupal and render a normal Drupal page, which is fine. Actually, in our case, the client um, asked us to do a 404 page with a hidden Easter egg product on it. So if anyone got 404, they could buy this random called a 404 bath bomb. It's brilliant. Um, so those ones are fine. It's the invisible ones that you're worrying about. If you've got the most obvious one is a fad icon missing or a CSS background image, it might not be obvious that it's there, it's there unless you're looking at the logs. But every time Say you've got a CSS background file image missing, you're generating a whole Drupal page load of that 404 page just to tell you that you haven't got an image. So fast 404 and some configuration of that um, is really, really important to stop. Uh, fast 404 will basically deliver a really simple error page, not a Drupal, full Drupal build error page. That one's really important as well. And the next thing we, we looked at was content editing. Um, depending on your setup, you might be logging into the production site to edit content, hopefully not. And hopefully you've got some sort of content staging, but that's a luxury not everyone has. Um, if you're editing, for example, orders in the situation I said just now, um, content or con orders are the sort of content that you can really only look at on the production site because you don't have copies of them on staging. Um, so what we've done is deployed a headless commerce system via web services that basically takes the orders to another system and allows them to log into that system. Because otherwise what we were seeing was um, we had customer care logging in to search for orders. They were slowing the site down. Customers were phoning up to complain that the site was slowing down. So customer care was searching for their orders and the whole thing just snowballs. So building a headless commerce system for them allows us to move those orders off. Um, and it also allowed us to do something different, which was 
to use Apache Solar, which is what Acquia Search, which is just the wrapper around Apache Solar. What we're able to do, um, if you imagine our system take all the history back in a few years, we've got a couple of million records in the commerce table. Um, so if you're, even if you're searching for an order that you know the number of, it's still not that, you know, not that fast. Um, and if you're searching for an order, say, on the postcode, the database query to do that is quite complicated and with a million records on the table was hideous. So what we've done is we've hooked up that back end to, to Solar using Search API and we've indexed all of that order and customer content, which it was something that didn't occur to me at first because we always think Solar Search is, is for customer external searching content. But in this case, we were able to separate the index, very important, um, so that you can actually search for a customer and therefore you can get the type of postcode, you'll get a result in you know, half a second, nothing, nothing, no time at all. So that was a good one. Again, limited, whether you're able to do that or not uh, depends on your setup, but it's definitely a, one that didn't immediately jump to mind that we could do. Right, the next one, cloud cash form. Does anyone know about the cash form table? Yeah, okay. So the cash form table, um, every time a form is displayed on a Drupal site, the cash form table is populated with a record. The cash form table, so if uh, an add to cart button is a form, a flag like this product, that's a form, and every single one of those is, is building up. And what we found is when the site's really, really busy, um, that table can be Become absolutely ginormous. I mean, uh, we were looking at 80, 90 gig of data in this cash form table. It's a ridiculous size of table. Drupal Core has a way of clearing that, but it, it's hard coded to assume quite a generous cache lifetime for a normal normal site. And this, these these sort of cases are really about when the site's very busy. Um, so what we had to do is change that. There's actually a module out there called Safe Cache Form Clear, which is very specific. Um, and what it does is it clears that just, so instead of, um, that, that cache will be cleared when you do a normal cache clear, um, but this particular module is clearing that table quicker than it normally would in, in real life. Um, that, this, that module was, was developed for BBC Good Food, NBC, those types of sites. So it, it's clearly not a, commerce specific problem, it's something that, that people are seeing. Um, so that's just a very, very obscure module that might help you out. We, we found out about that one when the backup stopped working. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> we found out about it when the database hit 100%. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a nasty one. And, and the thing with that as well is if you, whenever you do a new code deployment, make sure you run cron. If you've got a checklist, put do a cron run on it. Because what we, what we found at one point was that something got deployed which broke cron, which broke this. And that cache form table went <laughs> very quickly. So um, you've got to, got to look out for that one. I did do a side on CloudMate, but we talked about that. Um, so yeah, the other thing we found with CloudMate is that you can share images between different sites using Media API. Um, and that allowed us to, when we're building the Japan site or the Brazil site or something like that. We don't have to upload all the assets again, we can just share them from here. And we've sort of talked about that a little bit. Clean up, clean up, this is another one. So I mentioned that the commerce order table, now if you're not aware, when, when you make a new order in, when you, sorry, when you add something to your basket in Drupal Commerce, you're actually making an order. It's just that that order is in cart state. So what's happening here is every time, every customer that adds something to their basket is making a new order record in your database. And that means even if you take, I don't know, conversion rates on sites vary, but they're not normally more than about five or six percent. So for every, every five orders you take, you've made 95 baskets. And you've got, so that's gonna make your table grow uh, exponentially. So there's a lot of traffic that hits that commerce order table 
And what we need to do is try and keep that table as manageable as possible. There's a module out there called Commerce Cup Exploration, which introduces a um, couple of rules, drush commands, that sort of stuff, that allows you to take any basket that, say, over a week old or over 30 days old, whatever your policy is, and get rid of it. So that's really important, because otherwise you end up with carts. No one's ever going to convert them to all this. They're just sitting there, wasting space. Um, so you need to get rid of those. We actually have quite an aggressive cart abandonment uh, policy now, just, just for that reason, really. So if someone's halfway through checkout and they've been away a week, we just get rid of it now. It's just, you don't want to keep that stuff any longer than you really have to. I mean, it's nice to log in a year later and your basket's still there, but you've got to weigh up these things. Is, is there a way of like, doing something with that data, ideally like adding it to a wish list or some kind of recommended list or something uh, before you get rid of it? Not automatically that I know of, but if you have wish list functionality, that is definitely a, an interesting way of using that. Yeah, I mean, it's all rules based, so yeah, you could, you could say, Instead of deleting that, you could convert it to a wish list. You could just add the SKU to a wish list, couldn't you? Because there's yep. a wish list module. So you could use rules to grab, grab the order, grab the SKUs of the unit line items yep. within the order, and just add that to your wish list. It's making a bit of an assumption about the customer, though, to do that. But, you know, theoretically, yeah. But they've already, <laughs> they've already sort of created a, yeah, an yeah, order yeah. they didn't want to proceed with. So it's, yeah, yeah. It's not too much of a leap. Um, this next one is a, is a, I think this one hits almost anyone that's doing Drupal Commerce. By default, um, you, you know, Drupal does entity revisioning. So every time you save an entity, it makes a copy, so you can roll back if you want to, which is great for content, but for orders, it's a real pain. So that means that not only have we got two million records, we've got two million records in our revision database times don't know how many. So every time someone adds something to the basket, it makes another copy and another copy. Every time someone changes a little bit of detail, it makes another copy. So we need to make sure that we turn off revisions on orders. And there's this nice little module, uh, Alex, one of Alex Potts' modules for when he was at Capgemini working on the uh, Royal Mail, because they had the same sort of problem. What this module does is it, it basically rewrites the SQL that's, that's, uh, that's doing the revisions to stop it doing it. And it also has a very nice function of uh, wiping out all previous revisions if you only just thought of this problem. So uh, that's quite nice, uh, very nice little, again, very, very niche module. So we don't need revisions, we use the message module to track the changes to the order. So there's no benefit whatsoever in us having revisions on order lines and orders and addresses and everything else. Um, then we've got other checklist stuff, this stuff's really obvious, so I guess you probably do all this stuff, like turn off your UI modules, don't have views UI on in production, don't have display speed UI, because they're all just loading and doing nothing. Um, make sure you've turned off your dev modules, like DevL or whatever else. Um, don't use dblog, the database log, I think that's a, an, an obvious one again. We use syslog, so it records all your watchdog data to the server logs rather than to the database, which is much quicker. And another little one, which you may not know about, um, the way views handles paging is a bit inefficient because um, it has to count how many pages of records there are. Um, it doesn't do that in a particularly efficient way. So there's a new module there called views light pager. And what that does is it replaces that pager with a very, very simple lookup, um, yeah, which basically you know, takes that away. So if you're using views to, micro to work through a big data set, like orders, for example, then that's something you, you might want to look at too. Nearly there. Um, clearing caches. Now, we clear caches all the time, everyone does. It's like the first thing you do. But when you're on a really high, pro high traffic site, clearing all the caches is a pretty disastrous thing to do. So what we have to do um, is just be aware that you can clear caches selectively. Uh, especially you can use Drush to do this. You don't have to just do clear all because that's going to add so much load to your server um, in the short term. Do so use, what we sorry, do you ever use flush the single page module? Uh, I haven't used that. No, no. I this this is things like normally you're flushing a cache because you're doing a theme change or something. 
So you can do selective cash flushing of just those things. So it's just one of those sort of little things that if you're just used to working in a, a low volume environment, you just say, yeah, clear the cash, it'll be fine. But you do it in a site like this and the phones light up, so <laughs> you can't do it. Um, so that, that's that one. Oh, I've got a couple more bits left and then we'll do a few questions. So solar, um, or aqua search that we used, the, this is a, a back end, it's a specialist server for search. Uh, it's a Java based thing and it's just really good, really, really fast at doing searches. So what we do is we replace the Drupal core search, which is a bit slow and it's not particularly powerful anyway, um, especially when you're doing things like faceted search. So Solar, and we, what we've actually done here is we use Solar in a slightly different way to most people have expected um, by using Solar for the categories. I'm going to show you one now. Um, so using Solar for search is, yeah, that's, that's fine. So when, you, when we search for bath or bubble bar or whatever, we get the list of products as you would expect. But what we did is we pre-index, as we send the data up to Solar, we pre-index the rendered version. Because if you, if you use this advantage of Solar delivering your data back really quickly, um, then, then when you get it, you have to then run it through Drupal's theme system again, and you've sort of negated your own advantage. So what we do is we, um, let's show you, ah, it's too fast. Um, each of these things here, we'll send up to Solar looking like that, all the markup for that, and then when we, when we bring it back, we can render it straight away. We don't have to go and figure out what the price is and what the star rating was. We can send the whole thing together. And what we're able to do then is treat the category pages, like this one, as actually a search result. It's not a view, it's just a search result. And that allows us to speed things up even more. So again, chipping away all of these little, all of these little things. And I've just got my five minute warning, so the very last one I've got is having an emergency mode. If you know you're facing a, a high traffic situation like Christmas or Valentine's Day or something like that, um, develop an emergency mode, figure out what on earth you can switch off, pare it down, turn off the social, whatever you need to do to get through it, and or Maybe, maybe you just have that as a, in your back pocket if, you ever, if you're going to hit a problem. The worst thing you can do is have a problem in the middle of Christmas or something when there's very little you can do about it. So have an emergency mode that turns some stuff off. That's my advice. Um, and the last one, just being prepared. Load test. Um, profile your traffic. Know what your acceptable failure points are. The thing is, you know, if it depends on your client, what what is acceptable? Is, is five second page load acceptable when it's really, really busy? Or is it not acceptable at all? There's no point in trying to design for a situation there. If, if, you know, if it's normally one second and, and it's really busy and it's two seconds, it's probably okay. And people know if it's a sale, it's gonna be a bit busier. So it's, it's getting an understanding of what, what is good enough okay, what is good enough, what's the traffic, how many people, you, you can build an infrastructure that will support 50,000 concurrent users, but that's over engineering, and you're never going to have the budget to do it. So it's a case of figuring out, okay, what's our limit? What are we really building for here? Is it 2,000, is it 5,000? And then we aim for that. If it's above that, you might get a failure, but that's not what you were designing for, and you need to have realistic expectations. So um, load test stuff, load test through a realistic profile, um, there's plenty of uh, tools, online tools out there to do to load tests and stuff. I'm going to stop, so if there's any more questions, I know we've scattered a few in. But we're gonna Quick one, um, you were talking about Orthcash and using it in Varnish. Uh, is it, I was just having a discussion, or I've had discussions over the last two days about using Orthcash with Redis. Okay. Uh, have um, you done that? I haven't. Uh, even using it with Varnish requires some configuration mm -hmm. stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, I haven't used it with Redis, no. Uh, um, because apparently there's a um, I was talking to Carlos guys, and they say it's easy. And um, well, it's like you know anything about Redis, which I don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, no, that's fine. Yeah. Their, their platform SH uses Redis yeah. and not Varnish. Aquas uses Varnish, mm -hmm. um, and I only really use. I, I've played with platform, but my general approach is to stick with one rather than trying to learn everything. <laughs> 
So yeah, I believe it does work with Redis. Um, yeah. But it will work with both, it's just going to be great. Is there a selected cache for the taxonomy or the nodes? Can you just in there? Uh, if there is, I don't know of it. It sounds like there probably should be, yeah. um, but I've not used them. Yeah. Yeah, you just mentioned that you did like an independent audit admin. I, I just wonder whether that was like something you built out from scratch or whether you integrated with another system. Or, um, um, in this case, it was another Drupal Commerce system that was connected to the first one by okay. the same test. So it was something we worked on with Commerce guys. Um, the other aspect of that was they wanted a much better UI for ordering because they need to do things like refunds, reissues, mm -hmm. if an order gets lost in the post and send it out again. Yeah. Loads of stuff like that, which the, the conventional back end wasn't good enough to support. So, yeah. All right, I think they're itching to get in if there's any others. Oh, but uh, anyway, I'm here. Just a really quick thing. Yes, yeah. something got raised last night. It's an idea to wipe your own cash handles if you really, really are awesome. stuck. Uh, we yeah, I've never had to go to that length. Uh, yeah, no, you can write your own yeah. handles to handle edge cases. Yeah, we certainly use the internal caching API as well uh, in certain circumstances. Yeah. Thank you very All much. right, I'm around all week, Nick, anyway. So. Thank you.